Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Psychedelic Science Conference. We're all very excited to have you all here. My name is Ashley Booth. I'm the founder of an organization called the AWARE Project in Southern California. We're a community building and educational organization, so check us out online. Um, it's my honor this morning to introduce Torsen Passe. Torsen Passe, MD, PhD, is professor of psychiatry and psychotherapy at Hanover Medical School in Germany and is currently visiting scientist at Goethe University. Dr. Passe has uh, studied a variety of disciplines and worked at the Psychiatric University Clinic in Zurich as well as Hanover Medical School where he researched the addictions and the psychophysiology of altered states of consciousness and their healing potential, including clinical research with hallucinogenic substances. Please join me in welcoming Torsion. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, hi. So, and not so much people here because it's just history, but it's interesting, I think. And so um, um, I'll uh, tell you that I'm... Uh, involved with MDMA since the beginning of the 80s and so I'm kind of predisposed to tell something about its history because I followed that path uh, of the substance and what happened and it was originated in Germany or originally synthesized that makes it also uh, easier maybe for a German to talk about it. So I will give you a short overview of the history of MDMA which I have researched on since the last three years, and I'm uh, virtually ready with a book about it. And, oh, sorry, because this is Darmstadt, where the company is located, uh, and it's a picture from the turn of the century, <clears throat> the company Merck, which still exists, uh, who has which has synthesized um, mescaline and uh, MDMA and uh, the first time. So... Uh, the first period uh, to um, elaborate on MDMA is uh, 1912 to 1959. <clears throat> and I will give you um, information about two rumors which are around, and we have done research on that. And the Nobel Prize winning chemist and gas war chemist in Germany, Fritz Haber, uh, known for his uh, discovery of uh, the synthesis of ammonia, uh, uh, was uh, rumored to have been synthesized MDMA in the 19th century. Uh, we researched on that, and in his dissertation, he came quite near to it. He was doing stuff on some um, um, smelling molecules, uh, but he never synthesized MDMA or something equivalent to it. Um, MDMA wasn't produced as an appetite suppressant, which is sometimes, sometimes claimed. But MDA was tested as an anorectic drug, and therefore there may be a confusion about that. Okay, so the German pharmaceutical company Merck uh, patented the synthesis of MDMA in 1912. But it wasn't ever synthesized as a stimulant or as a drug. It was synthesized because uh, at that time the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies were looking out for blood clotting agents and they found one which is named hydrastinine and uh, because the plant where that was derived from couldn't be cultivated, they were trying to synthesize it. And so uh, Dr. Decker, an interesting anecdote was, it was a few hundred meters from where I was located when I was reading that stuff. Uh, Dr. Decker uh, developed a synthesis and offered that to Merck, but at last he sold it to another company, Bayer, and because of that, Merck and other companies tried to circumvent the synthetic route which was described in the patent, but they were not easily able to do that because the patent office two times rejected their approach or their application because it's too similar to what the others have done, what Dr. Decker has done. And so they, they made a big loop to, to go around that patent and in the, in this, on this way they, they had uh, synthesized MDMA as an intermediate product or chemical. And in the former times, it was usual to patent everything on the route, right? 
and therefore it was patented. So there was no specific purposes uh, at that point for MDMA. So, but interestingly, it came out a few years ago when we were going through the Merck archives that Merck has in fact done some further testing on MDMA, which was not known up to now. They also issued a second patent on hydrastinin de derivatives, which included MDMA in 1920. And in 1927, they have tested MDMA on vascular muscles. And in 19... 52, they tested it on flies, how much they have to t give them to make them dying. So these were the first people or the first organisms which, which have absorbed MDMA. And uh, later on, uh, there, this is not quite clear, but the, it is obvious that there were uh, notebooks, uh, uh, notes in lab, laboratory notebooks uh, about a search for stimulants for the German military, for jet fighter pilots especially. And in that search, they also resynthesized MDMA to test it, but it was never tested on animals or in humans at that point of time. So MDMA and the military, it's a different story. It is mainly the American military. They tested mescaline, MDA, and MDMA. And not very much is known about that. So there were two guys which have designed the concept of a true drug. In fact, uh, 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 women giving birth to children were given a mixture of morphine and scopolamine, which is a hallucinogenic uh, drug from the night nightshade family of plants. And uh, when the, uh, a person was giving that, she goes into a kind of twilight state. And at one point, the, the doctor was asking the husband where the baby scale is located in the house. And he couldn't say, but the woman was answering in a trance state, like, oh, it's over there, you have to go there, there, and there. And so they said, maybe there's something going on that the people say things which they are not intending to do. And so the, the concept of the truth drug was born. And Stephen Horsley was another English guy who um, also propagated um, uh, barbiturates to be used in these narcoanalytic procedures uh, they were intended to be psychotherapeutic procedures as well as this true drug stuff. In the 1920s, in Germany and in the US, there was research on mescaline on an extensive basis. And they, uh, Kurt Beringer was the most prominent in Germany, Heinrich Klüver in the US. And from that research uh, on, they have known that mescaline may alter your psychic abilities and your cognitive abilities and your willpower in a way that... Nazi uh, doctors used in the concentration camps sometimes mescaline on some inmates of the concentration camps. And after the war, these protocols from this, this research uh, were looked up by the US military. Uh, and so they began their own true drug research to uh, uh, ease interrogation procedures. And they tested, in fact, mescaline in 1943 already. So later on, it was found in a more systematic research kind of thing by the military that masculine gives you too much cognitive disturbances, too much hallucinatory action, and too much mental confusion. And therefore, it's not the most appropriate drug to manipulate people. And they were searching for more specific drugs, which may have less hallucinatory activity, less cognitive disturbance, and so on. And there, they came up with some mescaline derivatives. Um, one of them was MDE, which is quite similar to MDMA. And they were testing these things in uh, the New York Psychiatric uh, Institute in New York on patients and volunteers, usually unwitting patients. And... Uh, later on, after a subject died in their research because he got a tenfold overdose of MDMA injected, uh, of MDA injected, then they stopped the research immediately and tried to install animal testing before they were giving it to uh, further subjects. And in these animal toxicology studies, MDMA was tested too. MDE, MDMA, MDA, and other masculine derivatives, uh, seven. Uh, in the whole. And later on, uh, a guy, um, 
named uh, Gordon, Professor Gordon Ellis from the University of California. Um, he was uh, interested in uh, the um, uh, in the masculine cactus. You can see him here holding it. And he was also doing research on MDA and MMDA, which he found to be much less toxic than MDMA. So that's also an interesting information during this animal testing. So the one guy died from died from MD from being injected with MDA. So the military was somewhat afraid that these substances may be toxic. And it was found in the animal studies that MDE as well as MDMA are more toxic than MDA. And so therefore they were kind of excluded. It's a speculation about that. So they came up at last with MMDA for being used. But it was never used on an operational basis as far as we know. But these files were destructed intentionally, so who knows. Okay, then, in the 1960s, virtually nothing happened in respect to MDMA because it was left by the military. And uh, so Binyaki in Poland issued a patent about another synthesis of MDMA in 1960 that was also published in the chemical abstracts um, in the US. There's a very vague information about the production of MDMA in 1969, but MDA became illegal in 1970, and since that time, MDMA appeared on the street. And interestingly, Sasha Schulging has had a request in 1970 about the synthesis of MDMA, and he had already synthesized it in 1965, and therefore he sent that recipe to a guy in the Midwest. And we don't know if it's really true, but the first treat samples were collected in Illinois, which is in the Midwest, in 1970. So one con could conclude that MDMA is in fact the first designer drug because it was synthesized to circumvent the scheduled MDA with kind of looking for the same kind of action, right? So it was designed to circumvent the law, which is the definition of a designer drug. And that was the first designer drug. There was a misunderstanding about that term because a lot of people think, oh, it was already synthesized in 1912, so it's not a designer drug. But that's not true because they came independently from these old patents and, and the military. They came to the conclusion MDMA may be an appropriate substance. These underground chemists, we don't know them exactly, right? <laughs> couldn't ask them. And so this is from our recent publication, and it gives you an idea where the first epicenter of uh, MDMA use was. It was in the Midwest. So these are uh, um, findings of, the, of street samples by the DEA and other related uh, as, uh, groups. So the time after that, you can see here that there were some labs already before Sasha Shulgin came across it, right? You know, these labs were found or known, and they have produced uh, kilograms or even um, uh, tens of kilograms of MDMA during that period. Okay, if you look at this, you see that during, uh, since, the 19, <clears throat> um, since 1975, the distribution pattern changed somewhat to, the, to both coasts, right? So the Midwest, Midwest was irrelevant then, and it uh, was mainly on these both coasts. So then we come to Shulgin's rediscovery of MDMA. Here, uh, I am in his lab with him in 1993. And so Shulgin, as you, some of you may know, has uh, tried mescaline in 1960. Then he was fascinated by its chemistry and its, its action, and he synthesized MDA in 1961 and MMDA in 1962, at the same time when Ellis was synthesizing it for the military, and he synthesized, according to his own statements, uh, MDMA in 1965, the first time, but didn't do it or didn't try it. Then he worked together with Claudio Naranyu, who is here on the conference, in the early 1960s, and they were testing MDA, MMDA, and, and that is an interesting discovery of my research, uh, Shulgin synthesized MDE, a closely related substance to MDMA, in 1976, 70? no, in 1967. 
And he sent a sample to Claudio Naranjo, and he came back with the information, no reaction, because the dose was too low. So Julgen lost interest in that specific branch of substances, so he failed to discover uh, MDMA because of that, maybe. And uh, later on, in 1975, Schulgen was informed by two, two, two students, according to his own statements, about uh, MDMA and its uh, effects. In 1976, he was informed by another student about a very good reaction to MDMA, and so therefore he did self-experiments in, the, in uh, late 1976 to 1977, um, and what he found is he has written in his notebook about an alcohol-like intoxication in the lower dose range, so to say 70 to 90 milligrams. And so he called it his low-calorie martini. As far as can be reconstructed from serious evaluating, seriously evaluating the facts, what we know, it seems, sorry for saying that, but it seems that Sasha didn't detect that this was a very specific and special substance at first. For more than half a year, he wasn't aware of it. In the later part of 1977, he handed it over more or less by chance to Leo Zeff, and he got the, as, such, as Anne Schulgen told me, the appropriate reaction, and then the whole thing took off, right? So, and uh, another uh, achievement of Sasha Schulgen was that it was, at that point of time, it was legal for a physician to administer a substance to a patient if he had synthesized the substance himself. And so, therefore, Sasha was instructing most of the early psychotherapists how to synthesize, in his lab, MDMA for that purpose, so to stay legal. So George Greer, for example, was doing it that way. Others too. Okay, so we are coming to Leo Zaff and his influence in the whole matter. So he was called the secret chief because he was the uh, central figure of an underground network using psychedelics since they were illegalized in the end of the 60s. Here's a picture of him. He was called the secret chief because nobody knows about him, but should know, shouldn't know. There were some meetings at Azalan in a more, more or less systematic fashion, and it was, um, they were initiated by an invisible network of people called the Arupa Network, which is Association for the Responsible Use of Psychedelic Agents, and they were having these meetings at Azalan on a regular fashion, but they were invited-only meetings. And during the early 1980s, another entity was established by Rick Doblin and Associates, which, were, which uh, was called Earth Metabolic Design Labs. That was an institution. We are coming later to that again. So, and these guys were planning for further studies, even after it may have been legalized MDMA, and they were also preparing for the hearings. I come back later to that. Okay, so there was some psychotherapeutic use going on since the late 1970s up to 1984. There were these ASEAN conferences, there were some brochures and articles, but in general, they really try to avoid media attention so that they can use this longer, and they try to avoid the same fate as LSD had in the 1960s, to get too much attention, and then it has to be legalized and so on. So, and they also, during that time span, they initialized a psychophysiological study at a private home of one of the uh, early psychotherapists uh, to measure some basic vital parameters and the general reaction to MDMA. And uh, I will give you a very short um, run through the early psychotherapist. One was jo John Downing, a pretty intense person. He, he was involved with LSD since the 1960s in psychotherapeutic work, and he also installed an institute on the Bahamas uh, giving MDMA to people in a very systematic and serious fashion. Another guy who is still with us here at the conference was Phil Wolfson. Uh, I will talk later a uh, second about his approach. And then you may all know uh, Claudio Naranjo, who was also involved with Shulgin and with MDMA, and he's also here on the conference. This is a more recent picture of him. And uh, as you may know, George Greer wrote the first systematic paper on the action of uh, MDMA in patient and uh, volunteers, together with his uh, wife, a registered nurse. Uh, 
they were doing MDMA therapy since 1980. And he's still involved in that research. So uh, interesting uh, is that these were the indications they saw in the 90, early 1980s for MDMA. And it's interesting that these uh, things are researched right now, right? All these diagnoses. So they discovered uh, who can be treated. And they also had installed some safety measures, which are very smart, I think. I can't go into details here right now. And I don't want to keep silent about the cases of sexual abuse and MDMA therapy, which, for example, led to the installation of two people treating a person, a male and a female. I, I very much uh, think that that's appropriate. And we have to have some control, some social control on these kind of things. So I'm personally convinced that we should apply these things in clinics, not in offices. However, with teams and supervision and all that. Okay, we are now coming to the Texas group, very prominent for uh, its uh, major proponent, Michael Clegg. He was in kind of offshot from the Boston group, which was a group of uh, chemists which have produced MDMA since the mid-1970s in, in the Boston area, and they gave it uh, mainly for free away, uh, not as much, they were kind of more a closed circle. But he was an offshot of them, and they, he distributed it very much in Texan cities. And also these guys taking it in these cities came to the conclusion you can really go dance to it. And so it was found empirically that it is a dance drug in this early um, uh, use in the uh, early 1980s. They used it as a party and dance drug. It was yesterday a film about the Star Club in Texas, which was representative of that. And it became such a big thing that in 1983, uh, a Senator Benson from Texas, uh, here is a picture of him, reported that to the DEA that there's a new drug around and they should do some measures on it. Uh, and so the Texas group, when it, MDMA became illegalized, um, changed their production to another country where it wasn't illegal at that point of time, which was Mexico. Later on, they came to the conclusion, let's change to Panama, because they have known some people there. And as far as the story goes, they even intoxicated uh, Noriega with MDMA and became quite sympathetic to that dictator, that gruesome person, because he was going into his childhood traumas and, and was crying and stuff like that. So, yeah, but it's, it seems that that story is real, so pretty interesting. But when they installed their thing there, even with the permission of Noriega in Panama, they want to install that plant there to produce MDMA, but the, the U.S. were intervening there, right, in 1989. And so, therefore, they couldn't go on. Okay, so what, what did the Earth Metabolic Design Laboratory do, uh, do, uh, do during the um, mid-1980s? They were preparing for the hearings, mainly Rick Doubling, he's here right now, and they did a survey on this early psychotherapist to learn to know what their opinion is about MDMA and its most appropriate use. They were also initiating animal studies. That was a topic of debate. So uh, Rick was pretty intense doing that because that's the re essential requirement to do further studies in human. You have to open up an FDA master file with uh, animal toxicology data first. And so they came, uh, they argued about it because some people were not okay on, from an ethical point of view to uh, make animals die or torture them, right? Okay, so... What does it mean? Three minutes or? Okay, okay. So they also initiated that psychophysiological study in 1985, and they had a conference in, uh, at Eselin in 1985. So maybe I have to stop after the hearings, but you know the more recent story is more known. So okay, so what, what were the hearings? So the DEA announced the scheduling here. It's a photo of that. This, they announced that they will schedule MDMA in 1984. And the, they were not expecting that any physicians or therapists would interfere with that process. So the general rule is you can interfere with a scheduling process. Because, for example, if you're a pharmaceutical company and they want to try to schedule your drug, you have to interfere and you have to bring experts and stuff like that. So the psychotherapist uh, hired a lawyer and interfered with the process. And so the hearings about MDMA were held in three American uh, cities and... 
the administrative law judge was in, in charge of the, of the hearings uh, and he was a person of the DEA, but he tried to be objective. And so uh, he was hearing all the witnesses, witnesses from the physician's side as well as from the DEA side. And the major issues were, has it a high potential for abuse? Has it a currently accepted medical use in the US? Is there a lack of safety under medical supervision? Is it a hindrance for research if it would be scheduled? And is MDMA neurotoxic in humans? And what they, the judge came to the conclusions, as you can see here, So the only matter was this, but there were no enough data available to decide about that. And so the judge was saying, should it, be in, it shouldn't be in Schedule 1, it should be in Schedule 3, 3 to be available to researchers and uh, more easily for clinical studies. But the DEA overruled its own judge by the decision to, we will schedule it. And they already had, had, during the process of the hearing, they already emergency scheduled MDMA under the law. And, but these uh, activists were, uh, were doing an appeal at the appeals court, and during that process of the decision, MDMA was, in fact, on a juridical level, allowed again. I'm done? Okay, so, and this is called the Grinspoon window when it was allowed again because Lester Grinspoon was in charge of that appeal. So, okay, I have to stop now. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you.